Today, we have the second part of David Schweikart's two-part lecture. We heard what's wrong with capitalism last time. In a way, that's the easy part. Uh, the difficult part is um, what to do about it, both where we want to go and how can we possibly get there. And uh, give us instruction. All right. Comrade. <laughs> <David>. <laughs> Well, you know, thank you uh, once again for a chance to talk about something I really care about, really love to talk about. Um, as Eric said yesterday, I told you how bad things are, you know, justification for capitalism, uh, what's wrong with capitalism. Basically, I had the seven count indictment, uh, the inequality uh, that's built into the system is now spinning out of control, uh, unemployment, uh, overwork. Poverty in the midst of uh, prosperity, poverty in the midst of plenty, uh, the fact that we have this economic instability, you know, which seems to be irrational, uh, then uh, looming ever larger, the degradation of the environment, climate change, uh, and um, the degradation of democracy. So those are my seven counts. So today I want to say, what an alternative would be, you know, that could at least, if not solve all these problems, but mitigate them significantly. So, basically, and it's going to be a simple model, because I think to get a, an idea of what, is, what an alternative would be in order how it might work, you have to have kind of a picture, you know, that's comprehensible of what an alternative would look like. Uh, it would be economically viable, but would be much more ethically desirable. One way of thinking about it, I think of capitalism, we hear, think of capitalism as a free market economy, but actually there's three quite distinct markets, kinds of markets under capitalism, right? There's the markets for goods and services, okay, enterprises compete, you know, for customers, consumers, and so on. Then there's the market for labor, you know, you've got to go out and find a job and compete, you know, and, and negotiate salaries, and there's the capital market. So. You can think of economic democracy, which is what I'm going to call it, is, you know, you're keeping the market for goods and services, competitive markets for goods and services, but you're going to democratize labor, you're going to democratize capital, and in the process, you're going to democratize democracy. So that's the picture here. And I've got a basic model. What I do is talk about a basic model and then an extended model. So the basic model uh, starts with democratizing labor, worker self-management. I don't know if you ever thought of this, but I remember it occurring to me once as a light bulb going off, like, we as a country, we believe in democracy, you know, we elect our president, give someone the power to send us off to war, to kill, to be killed, and we elect our congressman, we elect our mayor, we elect our uh, uh, senators, I mean, our, state, our, our governors, and so on and so forth. Why is it when we go to work, we don't get to elect our, bo our boss? Why do we lose all our democratic rights? You, free speech? You don't have free speech when you go to work. You'll be fired if you say something you know, the boss doesn't like. You know, what's going on here? Okay. Uh, now, of course, the instinctive response is, well, workers aren't competent to figure out who the best you know, boss would be. Oh, but we're competent to select a president, or we're competent to elect. We'll come back to that in a minute, but that issue. What does it mean to have you know, a democratic workplace? Well, there's really two parts to it. First of all, you have an elected worker council, one person, one vote. So it's democratic. Workers vote, one person, one vote. You elect a worker council. The worker council then appoints upper management. Okay, and then major decisions have to run through the worker council. Uh, so you've got Worker control, ultimate authority rests with workers in the enterprise, okay? And then you've got the distribution of the profits. Workers in a democratic firm don't get a wage, you know, you get a share of the profits. I mean, technically, it's, you sh it's a share of the profits. Uh, now, notice profits are defined differently in a democratic firm than they are in a capitalist firm, because in a capitalist firm, profits include 
you know, it's the difference between what you, your costs of production and what the selling price is, but costs of production include labor in a capitalist firm. In a cooperative firm, the costs are the difference between what you sell your product for and the non-labor costs, you know, and so on. Now, that's what gets divided up among the workers. Not necessarily equal. In fact, it's up to the workers to decide, but most democratic cooperatives decide, no, there'll be some inequality. You know, some people that have more skills will get more, some people that have more responsibilities will get more, because you are actually competing also to have good people, you know, in your firm. Uh, seniority, you might want to give people, you know, some greater shares. But the point here is, even though there's inequality, it's agreed upon inequality, and everyone in the firm has a stake in the firm doing well. Okay. Uh, and not only the and you doing well and working because how well the firm does. Also, how well your are your coworkers, you know, working hard? Are they being conscientious and so on? So there's this collective, you know, responsibility here, which means that you know democratic firms typically have less supervisors. You don't need as many foremen and so on. You don't have to have people monitoring to make sure people work hard because it's in your own interest, you know, to do so. So when you actually look at the data about Efficiency, you know, almost all of the studies, there have been lots of cooperative studies, and almost all show that democratic firms are at least as efficient, you know, as capitalist firms. And this is the main reason, because you've got this worker orientation, the stake that workers have in the firm. So democratic firms do work. Now there is a question that always comes up, well, if they're so efficient and they're so good, why aren't there why aren't there so many more of them? You know, why haven't they proliferated? Isn't that the way the market works? You know, the best, you know, dominate the We'll come back to that, you know, in a minute when we see some of the differences. <coughs> but worker self-management. Then there's the competitive market for goods and services. Uh, basically, what we, like we have now, prices for goods and services are largely unregulated, set by supply and demand. And it's interesting, uh, the market in this sense sort of is a form of democracy. Milton Friedman always makes this point, you know, it's actually... When you're buying something, you're voting with your dollars. You're saying, I like that, we need more of that. You know, people that don't like something, you're not voting for it, the prices go down. So the market is responding to what people want. And, and Friedman neglects this part, if the inequality, if the, if the distribution of income is fair, you want your market to respond that way. Okay, so that the market itself isn't really the problem. Now this, of course, is very contentious. Uh, very, it was very contentious when I was first arguing this on the left among socialists. It's still contentious, although less so than it, than it once was. But anyway, I am defending a version of market socialism. Then there's a the question, oh, it's firms strive to make a profit, but it's the difference between sales and non-labor costs. Okay, social control of investment. Now this is another issue. Uh, James Galbraith, uh, the son of an economist, son of John Kenneth Galbraith, another well-known economist, uh, has remarked, you know, markets are good, but they've got two defects. The poor don't count, and the future doesn't count. Uh, market decision, and this is more true now than it was even when Galbraith made this comment. Uh, Decisions about investment, particularly in the financial markets, you know, if you've paid any attention to those financial markets, these decisions that are being made there are not only, you know, not long term, they're often, you know, within seconds and microseconds and the latest computer programs and so on and so forth. What we're not doing is looking long term for what to invest. And, 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 and long term investment affects, you know, not just the people investing. It affects the community. What are we investing in? What are our priorities? You know, so we need democratic input into that. Okay. How do we get democratic input into investment? Well, we have a public banking system. Okay. Banks are public. And there's two parts to investment. Remember, you need funds, and then they need to be lent out to be invested in the real economy. Where do you get the investment funds? What we don't do is rely on private individuals, the savings of private individuals, that investor class that you then have to keep happy. No. Investment funds are generated publicly by a capital assets tax. 
Capital assets tax, basically it's a property tax on businesses, okay? A flat rate tax, okay, it's quite transparent. It all gets collected into a centralized investment fund, okay? Then what? Well, then it's put back into the economy. How does this work? Well, first of all, it, all of it, first of all, a certain portion of this will be set aside by the national legislature that's collecting the tax or for pro projects that are, public projects that are in national in scope. I mean, if we want to upgrade our rail lines or something like that, or we have some bigger environmental projects, yeah, that's going to require investing into the economy, you know, putting people to work, building things, we do that. The rest of it, though, goes back to states and goes back to communities. Each state or community gets its fair share. Uh, and that basically, you know, uh, prima facie is per capita share. So in other words, the investment funds then go to the states and go to communities depending on how many people are there. And a way of thinking about this, capital goes to where the people are. Under capitalism, capital goes where it wants to go and then if your community is losing jobs, then you have to move. You have to find, you have to follow up, go to where the capital is going. Let's not do it that way. Let's send the capital back to the communities. Uh, and when it gets there, uh, some funds are set aside for public projects. The rest are, okay, return to the regions on a per capita basis. And then, there, then the rest goes to public banks. Okay, so businesses, cooperatives, individual businesses, people wanting to set up a new business, you go to these investment banks, okay? They make the loans, okay? Uh, there, it's a pub, these are public uh, employees, you know, there, but it's open, the books are open, we can see who's making the loans. They're expected, the bank, the lending officers are expected to make profitable investments, you know? Uh, it's public funds, you don't want to be wasting them, uh, although, you know, there's a risk involved, but, you know, you, you take those risks. The community also can say, well, we want to, you know, encourage certain kinds of investment. You know, maybe we want to encourage companies to invest in green technology so we can make funds more readily available for that. Or we need more jobs in our community so enterprises will want to expand production, we can give them more money. It gives people some control over the future, you know, of their communities. So those are, you know, the basic mechanisms here of the basic model. Now, I also argue that there's some other institutions that I think would also be good to have in this alternative. The expanded model, there's three of them. The first is the government as employer of last resort. Now, you may remember the last time I pointed out that capitalism requires unemployment. Unemployment is the disciplinary stick that keeps workers in line because in a capitalist enterprise you've got this conflict of interest. From the capitalist point of view, labor is a cost. You want to get as much work out of people as possible, pay them as little as possible. Workers' point of view, you know, I want to get paid as much as possible and work as little as possible. How do you keep the labor force disciplined? Well, you've got to be able to fire them. You know, they got to, you know, be worried if they're not doing their job. Democratic firms have a different incentive structure. It's in everybody's interest, you know, to do well, to work hard, to see that your coworkers are also doing the same. So you don't need the threat of unemployment. You can fire somebody if they're really screwing up or something. I mean, yeah. But in general, you know, it's not necessary to discipline the workforce by threat of firing because, you know, your own well-being is immediately directly tied up with that. So, so there we can have the government as employer for last resort because the democratic economy is structured like it doesn't guarantee there will be enough jobs. So if there weren't enough jobs, the government needs to step in because I really think, uh, if you think about it, employment is more than just making money. An unemployed person, if you, if you are looking for a job and can't find a job, society is essentially saying to you, there is nothing you have to offer that's worth our paying for, okay? We may keep you alive, we may give you food stamps or something like that, but you're a parasite, you know? And at some level, you kind of think that, because you are, you're eating, you know, you're using the food stamps to buy food. Other people are working for you, but you're not giving anything back. 
So I think it's really important, and that's why it's not surprising, you know, when you have a lot, a lot of unemployment, you need a sense of self-respect. Somehow you join a gang, you know, become a, you, you do something, you know. But we need to guarantee, the right to work should literally mean the right to work. The government will guarantee a job. It'll be minimum wage, but it'll be doing something useful. Everybody ought to have the right to work. Okay. So, the second one, socialist savings and loan associations. Here the idea is, we want to distinguish. Under capitalism, there's, this, there's two things that go on with the banking system. You know, consumer loans, you know, home mortgages, this sort of thing, and investment in the real economy to produce more things, you know, or change your technology, this kind of stuff. They need to be separated. The investment, that determines the future. You know, so that we want under democratic control. Consumer loans are different in the sense that, uh, first of all, some people have savings, you want to save it, you know. Uh, we can put it in a bank, a savings and loan association. And if you want to buy something you don't have the money saved up for, home mortgages being the obvious big one here, instead of waiting till you save up enough money to pay for the full cost of a house, you can take out a mortgage, a loan, and pay it back, or automobile loans. There's various things like that. That's not a problem. So we can have those, those are just separate, okay? We can pay interest to people who want to save, you know, or we may not have to, if they're providing enough security, maybe enough, that's up to the community to decide that. Charge some interest on loans because you gotta sustain the, the people that are making the loans, the world loan. But, you know, that's a separate matter. That, so it's basically credit unions, you know, we should have a network of credit unions. And then the third one, is a role for capitalists, some capitalists under socialism. Socialism doesn't mean there are no capitalists, okay? Uh, and here I distinguish sort of two categories. One is, I call them the petty capitalists. Uh, these are the, basically your small businesses. I mean, technically, uh, small business, you're hiring workers, you know, and so on. Uh, but small businessmen, small business women, you're actively involved, you know. You're there, you know, you're managing, you're providing a service, you know, yes, you're hiring workers, okay, you still got that structure, but particularly since you've got a lot of cooperatives out there, you've got to compete for workers and so on and so forth, you want to make the conditions reasonable for your workers and so on. So I don't think, you know, there's any reason to say we got to make every small business, every restaurant, every into a cooperative. No, you don't, you know, small businesses are not the problem with capitalism. And the other issue, we might want to have big capitalists, entrepreneurial capitalists. As you might remember the last time I made this distinction between the entrepreneur and the capitalist. The entrepreneur is the person that goes out, comes up with a new idea, invents a new product, figures out a new way of doing something uh, that is profitable. Uh, the capitalist supplies the capital. Okay. Well, we need entrepreneurs. And we might want to have an entrepreneurial sec sector. The entrepreneur gets his money from the banks too, because the public banks are not are going to discriminate. But you can set up a business. You can hire workers, OK? You can become as big as you want. You can become as successful as you want, OK? But when you decide to step aside, you want to sell your business, you can sell your business. You, will, you sell it to the state. And when you decide to retire, in other words, when you stop being an active entrepreneur, active in the business, you sell it to the state, okay, which then turns it over to the workers to run it as a democratic enterprise. And if you think about it, uh, if you've built this new business and so on and so forth, and you know you're going to retire, you know you're going to move on, you're, gonna, you're not going to want it to just fall apart, so you know, you're going to want to figure out, you're going to make some hires so you'll have competent people in there to take over. You're probably going to institute some participatory mechanisms ahead of time so people are used to this. So there's really an honorable role for the entrepreneurial capitalist in this socialist society. You're not only, you're doing, uh, uh, okay, that's the thing, uh, two honorable functions. They generate useful innovations and they generate new democratic firms. So we can have entrepreneurs in our economic democracy. 
Okay, uh, that's what the structure looks like. Now, oh yeah, that's for the for an, uh, a country. Okay, but what about the society? What about the global economy? Okay, uh, because the ideal here, the ideal always uh, that is animating socialism. It's not just your country. We want the world to be different. Okay, we've got an obligation to the world. Uh, so what about trade? And here, something sort of highly relevant right now, with all the Brexit controversy and so on and so forth. I argue fair trade, not free trade. Okay. Free trade in and of itself, it's a lot easier for capital to move than for people who are restoring. Capital can go all over the world, look for the lowest costs and so on and so forth. That's not what we want. But what would fair trade look like? Well. Trade among rich countries, countries of equal level of development, that can be free. Okay, that's not a problem. Okay, the big problem with trade is when you've got, it is, and the point here is to distinguish two types, of, two types of competition. You've got healthy competition. Healthy competition is when you're competing, someone else, you know, another company comes up with a new idea or a new way of producing something or a new product. Well, it's healthy to say, yeah, we've got to stay on top of this, you know, we want to copy what they're doing well, you know, use that. That kind of competition is fine, okay? What we don't want is race to the bottom competition. We don't see which country will, pick, will have the cheapest product because the workers get paid the, less, the least. Which countries can sell that for less because they don't have so many regulations. They don't have to worry about the environmental regulations, that kind of thing. That's the kind of competition we want to block. How do we block it? Well, that's... Socialist protectionism. Now, there's two parts to that. There's the protectionist part. Oops. Don't know where it is. Anyway, protectionist part says uh, if the reason this product is coming in from the poor is cheaper because workers are pay being paid low, we don't want that. So we're going to put a tariff on the good coming in, okay? that will make the price of that good comparable to what it would be if it were to be produced by people being paid the same wages our workers are. We do want to protect you know, our workers from this kind of competition. Or if it's cheaper because they don't have environmental regulations that we have, well, we want to put a tariff to compensate for that. We do want to protect. But the socialist part says, and then we take that tariff and we rebate it to the poor country. Okay. Uh, to the, if it's a progressive government, we can rebate it. It's our money, our tariff. We can do with it what we want. We can give it to the government if it looks progressive. We can give it to NGOs. We can give it to the labor movement there. We want to help those poor countries develop, okay? But what we don't want to do is race to the bottom competition, okay? So that's the other part of the model. Ah, there it is. I just didn't so, blocks irresponsible competition and is rebated to poor countries to help them alleviate poverty and environmental degradation and so on. Okay, why is economic <laughs> democracy ethically and economically better than capitalism? Okay, now first of all, a couple of structural differences. I mean, you may think, well, democratic firms, they compete, it's a market, they're gonna behave just like capitalist firms. That's not exactly true. In fact, there's a couple of fundamental ways they're different. First of all, you know, democratic firms do not migrate to other countries in search of low labor costs. People don't vote and say, oh, well, let's all move to Mexico, it's a lot cheaper. No, okay. Democratic firms stay, and they don't even move to other parts of your own country. You, know, you have to get the majority saying, oh, no, no, it's cheaper. We'd much rather live in Arizona or something. Let's all move there. <laughs> So communities are much more anchored. I mean, companies are much more anchored in the communities, okay? Not only that, capital itself, remember these investment funds, the investment funds are all publicly generated, so they're not going outside the country either. So the investment funds all stay in the country. Enterprises there tend to stay you know, in the localities where they are, okay? That's important. And another one that's has a lot of really important consequences is 
Democratic firms don't have the same expansionary dynamic. Uh, this is something that economists were really fascinated by back in the 1980s when they were thinking about these kind of things, you know, the different dynamic, because they're competitive economy, you know, competing with other enterprises, but there's a fundamental difference. Capitalist firms tend to expand so long as economy <laughs> and scale are there. In other words, if you can even constant, constant, constant economies of scale, or doubling the size of the firm doubles the profits, a capitalist firm is going to do that, right? A democratic firm can be exactly the same. Doubling the size of the firm will double the profit, but it doubles the number of workers that you divide the profit among. So you don't have it. Once you, you know, as long as you're increasing economies of scale, you keep expanding. But once you hit that point, you stop expanding. Okay. An example of that that I think about is not just cooperative firms, but nonprofit organizations, <coughs> universities. Now, in Chicago, you know, I go to Loyola University. I teach at Loyola University. You know, I'm a medium-sized Catholic institution, good reputation. Across town is DePaul University, another Catholic institution about the same size, same reputation. We compete with DePaul. If DePaul comes up with a program or something that students really like or faculty really like, well, we'll try to <laughs> copy that, do something like that. But we have no interest whatsoever in de driving DePaul out of business, okay? We have no interest in, let's double the size of our department, you know, take their, why would we want to do that, okay? And in fact, if you think about it, the democratic incentive works in the opposite direction. The bigger, the less your democratic input counts, okay? So you want to keep expanding as long as it's benefiting everyone in your... But once it stops doing that, there's no point in getting bigger than that. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons why this famous argument against cooperative... Well, they're so successful, so efficient, why haven't they just proliferated everywhere? It's because just being efficient, you don't keep growing. You don't keep expanding, okay? So uh, this turns out to have other important consequences, this non-expansionary dynamic. Okay, seven count indictment. Let's uh, take them one at a time. Uh, the inequality, well, there will be inequality in an economic democracy. It's not total equality. But remember the last time, the inequality under capitalism, particularly under what we're living in right now is just mind-boggling. I mean, the top income is 10,000 times more than the president, and you know, this parade of dwarves and a few giants. But within an enterprise, you know, there will be inequality. As I said, workers don't have to give you, don't, everyone doesn't get this equal per capita share. They can decide, okay. And the evidence from cooperatives are, yes, generally, yeah, the people that have more responsibility and so on will or more skills, you know, get paid more. What's the range? Well, the range tends to be about one to three, one to four, one to five. Yeah, yeah, like these, this, my boss is worth five times what I'm worth, worth. You may know the data, you know, on corporations in America now, the, you know, the gap between the lowest paid corporate worker and the highest is now, the CEO is now 500 to one, you know. There's no way a democratic firm is going to, yeah, that guy's worth 500 times as much as I'm worth. I mean, <laughs> It's not going to happen, you know. So you get that kind of range. And also there'll be differences among enterprises. Some are more successful than others. Some are doing better than others, okay. But here, too, the interesting dynamic here is if a firm is doing well, it also doesn't keep expanding, but it's doing well. But then you've got these investment funds coming into other communities, other places. You're seeing we've got these funds to invest. This is kind of This product is really doing well. Well, let's copy that. Let's set up a firm like that. You know, we'll have competition. It's kind of one of the interesting things about democratic competition. The competition is less intense in the sense you don't want to drive your competitor out of business. You want to. You don't want to lose market share, or you want to develop an innovation that somebody else comes up uh, comes up with. But democratic firms don't nearly don't have nearly the tendency to become monopolies. One of the paradoxes of capitalism is the more intensely competitive it is, the more quickly you get monopolies, because you just drive your competitors out of business, you buy them up, and so on and so forth. That doesn't happen in a democratic economy. So you have some differences. 
uh, democracy that checked the inequalities, public investment. So roughly I'm saying about 10 to 1 maybe, you know, between the lowest paid, the lowest paid would be, you know, living wage, you know, because you've always got the option of government as employer of last resort paying, you know, living wage, meaning, so say 30,000. 10 times more than that is 300,000. I mean, that's no small gap, 30,000 to 300,000. It's certainly plenty of incentives there, but it's nothing remotely compared to what we have under capitalism. So, so that's the inequality. Unemployment, two things here. You know, one is this social control of investment that's coming into your community that looks like, you know, there's unemployed people that aren't getting a, we can, we've got investment funds to maybe set up a firm so that they can work in and so on and so forth. Or, you know, if that doesn't seem viable, well then there is the government as employer of last resort. So, you know, we can use our investment funds to try to encourage companies that, you know, Want, want to expand, we'll you know, hire some more workers, we'll make the loan easier to get, or, you know, we've got the government as an employer of last resort. We can have full employment, okay. Overwork, okay. That's this paradox of capitalism. The higher the unemployment, the harder the people that have jobs have to work, you know. The tendency to have to work more and more, because you're so anxious about, you know, losing your job. In a democratic firm, the structure is completely different. You know, if you get a new technology, okay, you've got a choice. Are we going to use this new tech, more productive technology to produce more, you know, and make more money, or produce what we're doing now and work less? This labor-leisure trade-off is non-existent in a capitalist firm. No capitalist firm says, oh, we've got this technology, okay, you guys, you can, we'll give you longer vacations, you can, don't have to work as much. No, you know. What happens in a capitalist firm, you get this, well, we're going to lay off part of you guys. Okay. That's not what happens in a democratic firm. And the more this importance of scaling back consumption, and this doesn't even scaling back, you're going to consume what you did before, you're just going to have more free time. The importance of having more leisure, the importance of, you know, not consumption out of control means that option will likely be more and more taken. So we've got a society that can use the productive capacities in a way that actually does promote human happiness and well-being. Okay, poverty. Okay, two issues. Uh, in rich countries, in rich countries, if you have full employment, this government is full employment, government is employer in last resort, basically you've eliminated. Maybe not completely, there may be, well, there will be some exceptional cases. You can have welfare programs that take care of disability and people like that can't work, whatever. But the, un the poverty problem disappears. Everybody that wants a living wage, you know, has access to a job like that. There'll be some glitches, some people just be irresponsible and so on. But, but that, nothing like the problem we've got now. Now, poor countries, uh, this is another issue. What should we do with respect to global poverty, this poverty in poor countries? Uh, what should rich countries do? Well, I've got a number of suggestions. One is, first of all, forgive the debts. You know, there's something just obscene about these poor countries having to use their resources to pay off the loans that they've been given. Forgive that. They're not going to be able to pay them back anyway. You're just making them practice you know, more and more austerity. Get rid of that. Phase in the, po the policy of socialist fair trade. Now, you know, fair trade, I've said, there should be this tariff. If companies are, countries are producing things that are cheaper because their workers are paid low, well, we don't want that to happen. Well, but if they're going to have to shift away from that industry to something else, we need to phase it in to give them time to make the adjustment and so on. Uh, but there is something, if you think about it, kind of irrational about saying, Yes, these poor countries, they should use all their resources for us, so we can consume mm -hmm. all this stuff, you know. Why aren't you using your resources for your own people, okay? Well, because it's cheaper to do it this way. Well, it wouldn't be, you know, as we phase in the, the, the uh, socialist protectionism, but also give help in that direction. Uh, first of all, free technology transfer. I mean, one of the objections to technology transfer, and the, the arguments for intellectual property rights are, well, if they go to the third, these poor countries, they'll be able to produce the same thing, 
you know, these drugs that only we're allowed to produce, you know, they can produce them for a very little, and then they'll ship them to us, and you know, and they'll put our workers out of business, okay? But if you're protecting your workers from that, then there's no reason why all the technology should be free. These, you know, you know, that people could benefit from that, you know, uh, benefit from the research we've done in pharmaceuticals and so on. Well, let's, there shouldn't be any, you know, tariffs on that. There should be no intellectual property rights on that. Uh, research and development, incorporating four country researchers, you know, uh, so we've got our university systems, we've got lots of research, we'll give people access to that, scholarships and so on and so forth, you can take advantage of that. Uh, toward poor country problems, you know, figuring out how to deal with, uh, well, among other things, I mean, the idea of what kind of technology, I mean, I think there's an argument to be made that, you know, you don't want necessarily the most efficient technology in the sense that that's going to put a lot of people out of work, you know, is that really the technology that you want the country to have? What kind of con technologies, intermediate technologies that get rid of the bur most burdensome part of work, but keep people employed, that requires research, mm -hmm. you know. Well, let's support that, you know, help people with that. And then, of course, what poor countries, uh, poor country economic democracy should do, or poor countries generally, aid from the U.S. to develop its infra yeah, infrastructure, make basic education, health care a top priority. One thing is important there, which I didn't put on the slide, but all this worry about the population explosion and so on, the population crisis. We know how to solve the population crisis. Amartya Sen wrote a nice piece with a lot of data about that some time ago. Educate women and give them access you know, to birth control. And eliminate the worst poverty, because in really poor countries, the kids are your insurance policy. A lot of them are going to die and so on. Some of them may make it, you know, if you can take care of the worst forms of poverty, educate women and so on. Because think about that, you know, we don't have a population problem. Europe doesn't have a population problem. You know, Japan doesn't have a population problem. Okay, when women are educated, it's not like you just biological urge just takes over. And, you know, and pretty soon there's not going to be enough space on the planet for all the people. So that's a solvable problem. Aim at sustainable self-sufficiency using your own development. I mean, I really think it's important, particularly given the ecological disruptions and so on, you know, the need for resiliency, the need, you know, for countries as much as possible, regions as much self-sufficiency as possible, so that when something goes out in one part of the world, everybody else is massively, I mean, there's still going to be lots of problems, but, you know, there's something irrational about making clothes over here and then ship, first of all, shipping your raw materials across the ocean, making the clothes and then shipping them back across, I mean, ecologically that makes no sense, you know, rationally it makes no sense. Let's aim at regional self-sufficiency. And in addition, if you think about it, I mean, when you talk about poor country poverty, there is no way you're going to say, well, we've got to raise the standard of living in these poor countries up to our standard of living. There's no way we have the resources available for that. Okay, we need several plans to do that. But the good news is you don't need that level of consumption to have happy, sustainable society, okay? In fact, you know, I think it's fair to say we are in some sense overdeveloped. We're consuming far more, you know, than we need to consume. And it's not making us happier to do that. So we can consume less, poor countries consume more. In some ways they may even have an easier time of reaching it. They don't have to get rid of all these bad habits or whatever. But uh, you've got to keep that in mind. This problem, the problems are solvable. We do have the resources, you know, for giving everybody you know, a healthy, happy life and to have a sustainable economy. Okay, instability. Uh, first of all, you don't have speculative bubbles, you know, because you've gotten rid of Wall Street. You don't have these private, you know, uh, investment funds and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, and I said this paradox of stock markets, you know, when you're buying shares, the stock market's going on, oh, more and more people want to buy shares, it gets up, 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 and then suddenly it pops, and suddenly it drops, and then everybody's out of work and losing their houses. No, we don't. the investment structure is very straightforward, it's rational, this is how much investment funds we have, it comes from our capital assets tax, this is, goes to these communities, this is what you're doing with it. 
There's really no opportunity here for financial speculation, so you don't have to worry about that. Nor the other, you know, deeper recessionary dynamic, you got to keep the investor class happy because if they n don't invest in the economy, they've got this money, if they don't invest it, put people to work, they save it. But if they save it, they're not spending it. The people who are buying, buying the commodities, you know, the people producing the commodities, people who are buying it laid off, then those laid off people can't buy as much, and so other people get laid off, you get the downward spiral, okay? We don't have this problem in this model, okay? investment fund is collected by taxation. If it turns out nobody thinks there's enough investment opportunities or certain regions, well, then you just cut the taxes, cut the tax rate. No problem. People don't have the money. It's not like people have money and they're not spending it. That's simple enough. So it's really not a problem in a democratic firm. Environmental degradation, well, two parts to that. Uh, Big one being economic democracy does not require growth for stability, okay? Uh, whereas I argued before, you do need a capitalist economy needs to keep growing because you've got these investors, the investors need to invest, uh, but if they lose confidence, they don't see the opportunities, they won't invest, then you get a recession, okay? Well, it doesn't work that way. Democratic firms are perfectly content to reach a certain size and stay that way. You know, we don't have, we can have control over the investment fund, we can phase that back, you know, we're not dependent on that, okay. And this larger problem of ultimately scaling back, that is going to require planning, okay. Our control over investment planning gives us the ability to do that. We say, well, we're moving to a service economy, okay. But think about that. Service means all these people in the shopping mall selling stuff, okay, they're serving, you're not producing anything. You're, well, if we're cutting back consumption, then there's not going to need as many of those kinds of people, and so we need, to use, we need to use our investment funds to help make the transition, to set up businesses that are doing something useful, and above all, to scale back, to cut back the length of the working day so that people don't have to work, and spread the work around. I mean, we need to do that. It requires planning to do that. The invisible hand, the market, won't do that. Okay, democracy, you know, lack thereof. Uh, well, first of all, economic democracy greatly expands the role of democracy, right? Okay, you have democratic work. Democracy expanded the workplace. You've got major investment decisions come from democratic control at the national and regional, and regional levels. And this, I think, is important because each and every year, you know, there will be funds coming into your community, investment funds, your per capita share. You've got to decide what to do with it, okay? That means citizens can get involved. What should our priorities be? How much of this should be public projects? How much should be to encouraging this, this interest or that interest? So there's a lot more role of active citizen participation. And there's a sense, since these businesses don't migrate out of your community or anything, this, they're part of your community, you want this to be a healthy, functioning society. And of course, there no longer exists this small class of people with sufficient wealth to dominate the political system. This immense concentration, you know, I was saying the last time, four billion dollars a year coming into the Koch brothers, you can fund four thousand candidates, give a million each, you know, I mean that kind of thing is so completely distorted our democratic system. You wouldn't have that. Okay, now some thoughts, and these are not the, the magic carpet ride, not the magic answer to this. Uh, the argument I try to make is there's, this system would work, okay? How can we imagine getting there? Well, I've got a couple of scenarios. I'm going to skip over the first one, the radical quick, and go to the radical slower. Radical meaning, the idea here is, what if we get in a situation where there is another economic crisis, massive economic crisis? But at this time, we've got a movement. We've got a political movement that's got an agenda, has got a vision and so on, that gets elected, okay? Think kind of like, you know, Roosevelt in 1932 in the Depression. Suddenly, there's this huge landslide election for a new vision, a new deal, uh, and, yeah, you know, you've got political control in the Congress, you know, 
lot of the states and so on and so forth. What could you do? How could you make the transition? And a, and a demand on the part of the other, we've got to change things. You know, we've had another one of these crises. You know, we've got this environmental crisis going on. We've got to change things rapidly. What could we do? Well, how could you get to the model of economic democracy? Well, one way is basically all these public traded companies, let's nationalize them, the commanding heights of your economy. How would you do this? Well, first of all, remember, in an economic crisis, the value of the stocks has plummeted. These government can step in and buy the shares, buy them for more than they're worth. Okay. Where are you going to get the money? Print it. That's what you're supposed to do when you've got an economic crisis. We printed trillions of dollars to bail out the banks the last time around. Okay. We'll just buy the companies. Okay. And Turn them over to the workers. Workers are now running them. Now, of course, you'll keep the same, you know, CEOs, you'll keep the same management and so on and so forth for a while. You're going to have time to make the transition and figure out how to do all of this. But, you know, nationalizing the companies wouldn't be hard to do. If you remember after World War II, a lot of countries nationalized a lot of their industries, their energy industries, their transportation industries. You know, in a crisis situation, you know, we could do that. Also nationalize the banks. Uh, we almost did that in 2008. Several banks were very carefully being considered. Instead, we just bailed them out, let them, you know, get back and keep their profits. No, take them over, nationalize the banks, break them up into investment banks and savings and loan association. Let's make banks simple, transparent again. Uh, you'll need a capital assets tax because we're not going to rely on private individual savings anymore for investment. Uh, but you know. What were the value of the companies? Well, pick a date and time not too far back. What was the value of their capital asset? Their stock shares, how many shares were there? Multiply those numbers. Okay, that's the value of your capital assets. We'll charge a flat rate tax on all of that. Uh, that last one's a little mis mistaken, a little misleading. The idea here is the vast majority of financial assets are owned by a very small percent of the population. But there are a lot of people that own some stock, okay, particularly people in retirement plans, okay, mm -hmm. you know, retirement, port retirement portfolios that are, well, that you've got to worry about, and I think you should, and the solution there I would suggest is, okay, if you've got a retirement portfolio, okay, exchange those stocks, because the stocks are disappeared, the government, you know, has nationalized the companies, but exchange them for long-term annuities, okay. So you will get paid, you know, until you die. That's the way the annuity works, and it stops. It's not like a shares of stock out there normally can be passed on. They can be given to your kids and so on and so forth. They just keep accumulating. No, this sort of phases this out. And we, of course, have to institute a public, you know, uh, Social Security. We've got Social Security. Make sure that Social Security is such that every elderly person has enough to live, you know, a decent, you know, Life. We can do that. We've got the resources for that. Uh, so that's in the event of a in the event of a major financial crisis, we could transform things. Now there's another way, slower still, without a financial meltdown. And this is kind of interesting because of the historical background on this. Uh, the Meidner Plan. Back in in the early 1970s, Rudolf Meidner who was the chief economist of the LO, which is the labor organization of Sweden. In Sweden, almost all the workers are in unionized companies, and all the unions are federated into this LO, okay? They had a big conference, I think it was 1973, where Rudolf Meinder presents this plan, okay? The plan is, okay, that every company, every publicly traded company, uh, we'll set aside, you'll make a certain profit for a certain year, 20% of that profit will be the value of that, new shares of the company equal to that value will be added and given to the labor organization. Now think about that. It's not costing the company anything. They still have their profits. You're not, you're not taking their profits. You're just saying, okay, you made a million dollars. Well, 20% at 200,000, issue $200,000 worth of shares and give them to the LU, LO. All that's doing is diluting somewhat 
you know, the bat, the number it's giving more shares, so there's more shares, you know, to share the profit with, but it doesn't affect the company. Okay. Uh, and this goes to the, the yellow then, the, their stock trust. They don't sell any of these shares of stock. They keep them. Okay. They use the dividends that they get from those to buy additional shares of stock. So over time, and Meidner was estimating 30 years or so, in many of the corporations, the labor would own the majority of the shares. And when you own the majority of the shares, you can control the management. So at that point, you can turn it over to workers to be run democratically. Okay. So it's a slow, peaceful transition. Uh, and at, apparently at the time this was proposed, the LO, you know, at the convention unanimously approved it. Everyone stood up and sang the Internationale at that point, you know. It was going to be a slow tr transition to, you know, socialism. Well, at this point, historically, the capitalist, Swedish capitalist class kind of freaked out on that and mass mounted a massive campaign. Um, and there were other bits of problems, but it didn't pass. In fact, the Swedish Social Democratic Party, which hadn't lost an election since 1932, before the war, was lost the election that year, and the minor plan was killed. But, you know, theoretically, I mean, that's something like it could be done. We would add nationalize the banking system, and actually Sweden did do that back in the 90s for a while in a crisis, nationalized it. They gave it back, but nationalizing banks can be done. I mean, basically, we did that bailing out the banks. I mean, they were ours, but we, again, we did claim ownership. And government is employer of last resort. Uh, so I think that could be instituted, too. So, you know, over time, we would have made the transition from capitalism to a democratic economy. Okay, what's the agent going to be? It's nice to say this is how we could do it, but how are you going to get an agent? And here, you know, I call it a new communism. We need a movement, uh, including not just a revitalized neighbor, labor movement, but all the participants. There's so many struggles going on now to make this world a better place, struggles about race, struggles about gender, environmental movement, you know, these things, and in a, in a real sense, these people are struggling for the same thing. We want a rational, just, sensible world, and we've got the resources to do all of that. You know, we need that, but we need it to be, develop a consciousness of being part of this global struggle. So, and it's just not nationalist, it's not just for your country, we want the world, and again, once we start thinking in terms of climate, any solution's gotta be global, it can't just be our, you know, our country. It's got to be a global movement, not so unlike what was inspired by the Russian Revolution, the communists, like, like we're going to change the world. Uh, and, and also push for reforms. You push for reforms now, the more reforms that are, first of all, you've got a vision of where you want to go. It gives you a sense of what kind of reforms you need. Push for those reforms. Get as many of those reforms in place as possible, okay? Uh, because it'll be easier to make, you know, the, the complete translate, transition if you do that. It doesn't matter. You, if you may not want to call it communism, okay. The important thing is for people to gain a sense of being part of a collective project to change the world. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre talks about that in some of his later writings, about how you change as a person when you suddenly see yourself as part of history and see yourself as being engaged in an historical struggle. You know. uh, that can be enormously empowering. You know. uh, I mean, because at some level it seems like it's impossible given the obstacles. On the other hand, it is possible. Technically it's possible. We know what needs to be done. Yeah, we can do it. So, let me end with three quotes. Uh, One's not the happiest quote. Uh, it's from uh, a writer that was had a lot of influence, you know, in my generation, you know, Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, and this was his last book. Uh, it was uh, A Man Without a Country, uh, just written shortly before he died, in 2005, I think it was. The crucified planet Earth, should it find a voice and a sense of irony, might now well say of our abuse of it, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. 
the irony would be that we know what we are doing. Mm -hmm. When the last living thing has died on account of us, how poetical it would be if Earth would say, in a voice floating up perhaps from the floor of the Grand Canyon, it is done. People did not like it here. That's what's at stake. Here's another quote you know, by a Nobel laureate in uh, literature, quoted by Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate in economics that I quoted last time. Oh, the, oh this is the picture. This is, this is the world. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up, and hope and history rhyme. But Seamus Henney, the Irish poet, this is quoted in um, uh, March Sen's book, The Idea of Justice. And then a final quote, it's one really that electrified me when I first encountered it. <coughs> 47 years ago when I just started studying philosophy. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. So I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Welcome, comments, questions, whatever. Where do we sign up? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we got to do. Yes. You presented a humorous view of, uh, of, the, of an economy. However, uh, it was Frederick Baptiste, a president who wrote a pamphlet called The Law, who defined it was, it was, it was, it was a capitalist and it came out of socialism back in France and wherever they had that over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, he, he defined it as uh, there's two groups of people. One group for, who Take the immediate resources and use them, produce a product, produce a profit, and produce their own wealth. And these and, and, and have the force to hold on to that wealth. Then there's a second group of people who are lazier, who use the government and the law to grab that wealth and put it into their own pockets. And they are called plunderers. And uh, and th that's the the, the uh, the mindset, I think, of these people that are in that 1%. They feel that they have generated that wealth, it is theirs, and to regulate the wealth, the distribution of wealth, a simple plunder. Well, I mean, there's no doubt that even virtually that same slogan, the makers and the takers, has become really predominant among, particularly the book I was talking about last time, Democracy in Chains, you know, this network, you know, it's being set up of foundations. That's the idea, you know. That's why democracy is a problem, because there's more takers than there are makers, so we've got right. to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, and yet, they say the, the wealth that's being generated massively through these financial institutions are doing nothing. They're not making anything of value. They're redistributing things that are already made. Yes? I guess I also have a little question, because right now we have such a monopoly in our healthcare system. There's no way we can afford the baby boomers. We'd have to get rid of that monopoly. How are we going to get rid of the monopoly of like health care? Well, I mean, first of all, one of the big problems is the drug prices, you know, and there's mm -hmm. no reason, you know, why we should have that, you know, and that's why. Uh, you know, what's the cost of production for these drugs? You know, we should get rid of this intellectual property sort of thing. It's available. And we can do that kind of thing. Uh, and there are enough people. Again, this issue, again, we think about economic problems in real human material terms. Do you mean there's not enough people around to take care of the elderly people? But we're talking about if we're scaling, there's going to be all these people needing jobs that have, could get useful jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. No, we don't need as many people selling stuff in the shopping malls. How about some useful employment, you know, mm -hmm. for these kinds of things? So, you know, again, I think when you have a sense of what are the pro collectively what are our priorities can how do we do it because you've got th this interesting thing about two problems one you know how so many people need work you know how do we get the work we're going to have even less we're going to be producing less and consuming less 
how do we spread it around? It seems to me, if there's anything like meaningful work, taking care of people is meaningful work. Mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, I think, again, it's not going to be easy, but it's clear, it's one of these things, you've got the contradiction, you see it can be done, you know, it's figuring out how to get there, and if people want to solve this problem, you know, we can solve the problem. Yeah. I guess just my big concern about the healthcare monopoly is um, all these new studies that have been pushed under about how Alzheimer's isn't really Alzheimer's anymore, it's all the different drugs interacting. Well, there's, that's another whole issue, and that again I think is an important issue, the whole issue of relation between diet and health. The kind mm -hmm. of, you know, and doctors get a semester. And mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there's the corruption that way, but I mean, one interesting thing I've been you know, showing my students recently is forks over knives, you know, the health advantages of a healthy, mm -hmm. no beat, you know, whole food, plant-based diet can drastically re reduce the incidence of a lot of diseases and this health care costs and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. I mean, so once again, it's kind of, you know, I mean, part of me thinks it's, this is a terrifying moment that we're living in, but it's a miraculous moment, you know. Uh, we're suddenly discovering that we could solve these problems, and people could be not only, you know, not they wouldn't be as sick, you'd be healthier, you'd be mm -hmm. happier, you know, it'd be less expensive. Likewise with the climate change, seems to me incredible, I mean, if you think about it. You know, had the chemistry of our planet been a little bit different, this whole thing could have been happening you know, a century ago, mm -hmm. you know. And we wouldn't have even known, but we do know. And not only that, we've discovered the technology, the solar technology. We can replace, we can solve these problems. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got the ability to educate people around the world. We do have ability to, to solve this problem of poverty, to educate women and so on, so we don't have a population problem. And men. I mean, that's what's just astonishing. <laughs> and men, oh yeah, and, and men. men. No, no, I mean, I'm thinking uneducated women, that keeping women from being educated is the problem. They don't know. Yeah, no, men, no. more men were being educated, but yes, no, you're right about that. Yes? Uh, I'm sorry about my harshness. Uh, I'm from India, but uh, when, you, when I talk in English, I'm not sure if I'm being harsh or not. So, um, like people in developed countries are electing people like Trump. So when you talk about ideas like these, do you think people would be ready in the developed countries to give money out to poorer countries? Because I'm definitely sure poorer countries wel will welcome that money. But do you think the people in the developed countries would be ready to do that? Well, I mean, they're electing people like Trump who are ready to um, come out of the Paris Act. I mean, right, right, right. That. No, no. I mean, you know. People, first of all, it's not a democratic society, so it wasn't that the vast majority of people wanted Trump. In fact, the majority didn't want Trump, and had their, you didn't have all this uh, gerrymandering and all of this, you know, voter suppression and all of this, it might be very different. But also, if you have a movement, I mean, you need a movement that says, no, we're going to make this world a better place, and it's international, you know, we do need to help. I mean, you're granted, it's, this is a struggle. But it's winning the hearts and minds of people, you know, I think. And I don't see why that's, that, I mean, that is possible, you know. Uh, I mean, if you think about, you know, again, the rise of the communist movement in the 20s and 30s where people were joining all over the world. We were going to have a, we are going to change the world. We are going to have a better world where everybody, you know, has basic needs taken care of. Everybody has decent work. I mean, it's going to take a lot of people, but the more people you have, the more people that sort of see the point of all of that. So, I mean, you can be, you can be cynical, and we don't know. I mean, maybe you're right, you know, but you're not going to know until we make the effort, you know. And even if we fail, my sense is it's better to fail trying than sitting on the sideline being depressed, because that's what you're going to be if you're just going to sit in the sidelines. First of all, thank you for the wonderful talk. My question... Uh, I mean, it seems to me that a lot of analysis around economic democratization hinges on having a social democratic state in the first place, at least in the arena of legal enforcement. But then, when I think about the mechanisms that you said that the state has to ration investment, has to discipline investment, and all that, that gives enormous room for state managers uh, for, you know, the ailments of the Soviet Union, like patronage and patrimonialism and all that. So what mechanism do you envision that we don't actually regress to the Soviet model, in which states 
assumes enormous responsibility, at least in the arena of investment. And it turns out to be not a desirable model. But then we do have, obviously, some you know, social democratic states, even right. you know, right. under capitalism, right. though increasingly less competent to encroach on the right of capital, like the Norwegian and the Swedish model. Right. So what guarantees that we don't regress back to social Well, I mean, first of all, you got the historical example, and I think people do learn from history. But secondly, the Soviet model, I mean, yes, it was, there were two parts to it. One was the terror that took place, you know. But we've got to remember, they were also developing rapidly. I mean, I don't want to minimize that was, but the West wanted to stop them. We wanted, to, they had to industrialize as rapidly as possible at all. Otherwise, they were going to be destroyed. The U.S., I mean, the West was going to invade. You know, they wanted them stamped. They saw them as a threat and so on. The society I'm talking about isn't. It, there's not going to be this. Well, I hope there's not, the other hostile country out there that doesn't want this experiment in democracy, in climate sustainability, and all that to succeed. Uh, plus, the model is specifically set up to be decentralized. It's not centralized planning. You're not trying to plan the whole economy. You're collecting the investment fund. Those funds go back to states, go back to communities as a matter of right. Okay, then. There's a variety of, there's some democratic planning about national plans that are, projects that are national in scope, but communities have a lot more autonomy, states have a lot more, and I think that is really important. And you've got the democratic participation, you know, at the grassroots level, because funds are coming in, what are we going to do, what are, so the, the importance of citizens to keep track of what's going on, because these things matter, and they come in, and you can, you're paying attention to what's going on in other communities, what worked there? Because even if you try a project in your community and it screws up, well, next year funds are coming in again. So you learn from your mistakes. I mean, this ability of human beings to learn from mistakes, including the mistakes of the Soviet. And before that was planned, you know, before that had been tried, it was not clear that that wouldn't work better. And it did seem to be working better. I mean, the thing is, the Soviet Union went from the poorest country in Europe to a superpower in, after being invaded by Germany and all of that, so it's not like this was a total failure, okay? And further evidence, when the Soviet Union collapsed, capitalism took over, it didn't flourish. On the contrary, it was the worst economic disaster, far worse than the Great Depression. To this day, life expectancy is lower now than it was back then. I mean, so we, we learn from the mistakes that they made learn from mistakes that China made, you know. But that's how we can talk with more confidence about something that would work. Yes? You kind of separate questions now. Sorry. First, a while, not that long ago, a lot of us had a lot of hope in Venezuela and Chavez and Ecuador and Bolivia. How did it seem a peaceful tradition transition to socialism? It's all falling apart in Cuba. Why? That's my first question. Two, what, what about the relationship between capitalism and the military? Yeah, boy, both of those are you know, good questions. Uh, in fact, you know, in the introduction of my book in 2011, no, I was very hopeful about the pink tide in Latin America and so on. Mm -hmm. It was a la and this is really difficult because if it succeeded, it was going to show you could have a peaceful democratic transition to a different society. Um, but now we see, I mean, a lot of it was sabotage because you still had that capital. It was sabotaging, you know, the, the reforms that were being attempted. And of course, in Venezuela, you were also dependent on oil. You were trying to do things about that, but that, you know, again, was very hard. This money, free money is coming in and so on and so forth. Why, you know, uh, so, and, you know, and of course the United States was doing everything it could to make these experiments fail, you know. Uh, certainly that's true, you know, in, in mm -hmm. uh, Venezuela. Cuba, I think Cuba is an extraordinary model to think. I mean, whatever the problems, and there are problems, but... Cuba, I've been to Cuba quite a few times, you know, I went actually the first time in 1991 expecting it to collapse like all of Eastern Europe and all these communist countries collapsing and so on. And the United States tightened the embargo, it's like, oh, the Soviet, they were supposed to be this pawn of the Soviet, Soviet Union collapses, oh, they're okay now? No, no, now we've got to tighten the embargo to make sure they fail. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was astonishing to see how people pulled together. 
and people lost weight, the, the burden was shared, you know, and the pride that people took in being able to do that, you know, it's to me just um, amazing. And also some recent studies, I mean, the, the data on Cuba, I, I give a lecture off of it, uh, an economic, a world historic experiment that must not fail, because uh, a couple of years ago, the World Wildlife Foundation had a study of countries in the world that have a high level of development in terms of education, literacy, mortality, and so on, and aren't consuming more than their per capita sustainable share of resources. The only country that fit that criteria was Cuba. And you look at life expectancy, life expectancy is the same in Cuba as it is here. You know, infant mortality is much lower in Cuba than it is in Mississippi. You know, lower than it is in the United States generally. But the southern states are much, much worse. You know, so there's so many things, and the U.S. is still trying to, you know, make that experiment fail. Noam Chomsky had this line, the threat of a good example, how we've got to make sure none of these things succeed because otherwise, you know, people are going to get the wrong idea. So I don't know. I mean, my fingers are crossed about Cuba. You know, it's accomplished and there's a lot of pride in what they've accomplished. There's lots of problems. We're going to see. This is a historical moment in so many ways. What about another strategy in addition to those that you laid out? And that's the sort of the crack strategy. We have this system that functions, and, but there's cracks in it. There are lights shining through from different forms of organizing labor, work, land. Uh, what, what about that? No, no. Those strategy. are also important, you know, I think, the Garo Perowitz thing, the you know, land trusts and cooperatives. And, and they, no, I think that's, those are also a very important part. And again, people that are part of any of that should be part, see, be, see themselves and we should see them as part of this larger global movement. You're looking at you know, where you can make reforms. And, and the, when you set up a reform, if it works. Like, for example, just the, having a state bank, you know, a public bank. Well, in North Dakota has got a state bank, okay? It was set up by a socialist back you know, in the 1930s, okay? But ever since the, the crash of 2008, how well it survived, and this is a bank that collects the you know, government revenues and so on, uh, does all of its loans to the state, keeps the money in the state, it doesn't get involved in a lot of these you know, financial derivatives and all of that. But a number of other states now are looking, about the looking into the possibility of setting up you know, a state bank, not instead of the others, but as another alternative there. You know, so, I think all of those things are very important. Land trust, all these kinds of things. But we should see that as part of you know, this global movement. This, I call it the counter project, the counter project to globalized capitalism. Yes? So it seems pretty obvious that there's no place for unbridled wealth in, in your model here. And there is right now in existence unbridled wealth. So I think. You either have an expectation for people to give up wealth or have it taken from them involuntary. Well, here's one of the interesting things about that. I mean, uh, I mean there is room for wealth, and my, my entrepreneurial capitalists can get rich and so on and so forth, but it's because they're doing something they're doing. But one of the interesting things about a financial crisis, I remember after 2008, you know, when the stock market went from 14000 to 7000 trillions of dollars lost, my brother calls me and says, where did it all go? You know, where did it all go? And you realize so much of that wealth are effectively pieces of paper, not even pieces of paper. They're in a computer program somewhere, you know. Uh, if there's a collapse, I like to think Marx has this famous line, the expropriators will be expropriated. You know, when the capitalist client, when the proletariat has enough power. There's a sense in which the expropriator are expropriating themselves, you know. They caused the collapse, okay? Mm -hmm. We didn't do it. In fact, you'd be, my one strategy there in a sense, we'd be bailing, we'd be buying the stock at more than they're worth, you know? <coughs> We're not taking it for nothing, you know? Uh, but the larger question, they're going to certainly resist. There's no question about that. Uh, and this is why the struggle for democracy is very important, you know? That class knows that if the people get too much power, they're obviously going to look around and say, you guys got this incredible amount of wealth, and look at all these problems we have. Remember back 
you know, after the war, the top tax bracket was 91%. You know, 91% of more, if you made more than a million, 91% of that was, was taxes, you know. It, American people, it was great. Of course, these people have all this money. They can afford it. They still got more left over than we have, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's going to, I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. they're not going to want to do that. They're not going to want to give it up. But that's where the good old Marxian class struggle comes in. This is really interesting, and it does actually. I kept thinking it sounded like you're talking about the post war reconstruction period in Europe where lots of societies had wealth taxes. Yeah. And yeah. The, the sort of sense of reconstruction after the war was not so dissimilar. But I actually want to ask how you would decide who's a mom and pop business that you're willing to allow to be a private business, and who would be, how you decide who's the entrepreneur who gets to have their private firm versus the ones that have to be. Democratic. Well, here, I mean, in terms of how big a business has to be before you're a, no longer a small business, I seem like we make a collective decision. So many employees. If you have more than its employees, then you're going to have to democratize it, turn into a. But in know. the era of automation, employees may not be a measure of how. I mean. Well, but see, I think if it's that small, we don't have to worry about it. You know, I mean, I, I mean, it's a good question, but I think that one, yeah, there's there going to be a perfect answer. No, but roughly, you know, if you have less than, pick a number, 15, 20 employees or so on, you're a small business, you don't have to turn it into a cooperative, okay, we're not going to buy you out or something like that. Uh, and ooh, your other question, part of the question was? The mom and pop businesses yeah. versus the... Oh, oh, but the so entrepreneur the entrepreneurs themselves. Versus the yeah, there my sense was, no, anyone, you know, that wants to be an entrepreneur can, they got a project, they go, go to the, the bank for funding, if they can convince the bank this might work, Try it. If it works, it works, and you can just keep. Then you've got lots of profits. You can reinvest in your own company. You can hire as many people as you want. You can be as big as you want. You know, uh, and, but when you decide to leave, you know, then you sell it to the state. So anyone can try, but you're going to have to convince the the bank that this is worth trying. And there's a lot of banks around. You can go around, shop your idea around. Okay, so. Just on that note, so if you get rid of intellectual property rights, how do you make sure that people actually want to be entrepreneurs and come up with innovation and then they invest in it, everybody can go and replicate it? Well, I mean, if it's something that people can replicate, yeah, it's going to be a little harder. But but people like, say, Joseph Stiglitz said, you can, you can have bone, you can have big prizes for people to come up with innovative ideas. Or, you know, you, how much incentive do you have? I mean, you could have intellectual property rights without this big a timeline, you know. I mean, it dissolves after five years or something like that, you know, how much money you can make. Because again, if you're in a society, something like we're talking about, this egalitarian society, the desire to have more and more wealth, just, it doesn't have the same effect, you know. It doesn't carry the same prestige and so on. So, the idea, you know, everybody realizes you've done this wonderful thing and so on and so forth, you know, is also part. But you can, you know, you can have money for that. If people copy it, in a way, that shows it's a good idea. Lots of people want to do that, you know, and that shows what a valuable idea is. It's how great you are, you know. I'm pretty sure that's why they invented patent law, was to force people to explain how they, to, it was to force people to make public their technologies mm -hmm. in exchange for 25 years of protection stuff in the original. Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that, but that, that's probably true. Right? But it doesn't have to be 25 years. Right, you can make it shorter, but it was to it. make it public. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, so, so I think that a lot hinge on winning the minds and hearts. And I wonder what, uh, what kind of social order mechanisms you have uh, in, in our disposal for that, um, I'm coming from from education, and, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you have any thoughts about how education can be a instrument for that or other. Well, see, that's the thing. There's so many things out there. It's hard to know how it. But the fact that yeah, people are educated now, you know, and if you could start, and that ideas, you know, have this way of ideas that are unpopular can suddenly take off, you know, when you start seeing them. Also, a big question mark in all of this is social media. You know, is it going to be a positive? Is it going to be a negative? Is everybody just addicted to their phones and can't think about larger things? 
or can these ideas, you find out things that are going on and you want to be part of this, you can organize. That to me is a big open question at this point, as to, to what extent, you know, we can, because, you know, again, I, in the sense is public opinion I, can change very rapidly. It looks like a long period of time when things are beneath the surface and then suddenly, you know, they can shift. And particularly if there's a crisis issue, and we're going to be seeing crises, we've got environmental crises, we may have another economic you know, crisis. There's, we don't know what the future is going to be. What we do know is it's not going to be slow, steady, you know, live happily ever after. We know that's not what it's going to be. In the beginning of your election, you presented a three-legged stool. I believe it was labor, capital, and what was the other one? Land. What happens when <clears throat> labor disappears, which it's doing right now with robotics and technology? I mean, we, have, we actually have machines that can talk to you on the telephone, and we have machines that can drive your car, park your car, drive you in plus, manufacture a, a wrench, uh, you name it. There's really no room for labor in, in, the, in the conventional sense. Do you think that possibly we could get uh, reparations for the people that are being displaced uh, by robotics? Well, first of all, remember, it's not the machines doing the displacing. It's the people that own the machines that are deciding to use oh, those yeah. machines that, you know, displace people. This raises a, another question, which I didn't really touch on, but democratic technology. I mean, technology is now, I mean, research on technology is not just intellectual. You know, it's who wants technology for certain kinds of things. So Marx talks about that long ago in terms of de-skilling, you know. You want the machines that require less skill. Human beings actually like to practice their skills, you know, but it's cheaper to hire people with less skills. So if we have more democratic control, first of all, they're not going to replace everything, but what do we want replaced? Do we want some things, just because it can be done, you know, doesn't mean we want it to be done, we can decide no, we actually, human be labor is an important part of being a human being. Now, we can also use it to reduce the time, you know, spread that around so that technology isn't making all these people unemployed, and then, as I say, the people that still have jobs are more anxious than ever, and so on. And you obviously can't just get rid of all the people because who's going to buy, what's, who's going to buy these goods, you know, that the oh, yeah. machines are producing? You know, that doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm also going to just add one more thing, that uh, uh, my wife's son is doing a recruiting in Silicon Valley for teams of people to advance this robotic program. I and mean, this is a full bore, multi-billion dollar enterprise. So don't be surprised if you have, you know, replaced most of the workforce. Well, but then it's not going to help capitalists because suddenly, nope. you know. In a, in, a, in a real democratic economy, you probably want maximum. I mean, there'd be no reason. As long as you have a basic income. What? As yeah, as I mean, you need, it's, there's a problem of how to create livelihoods. Uh, uh, it's, you haven't mentioned unconditional basic income. It seemed to me that uh, maximum automation plus a generous unconditional basic income uh, is, a, is a desirable outcome. Well, it doesn't mean that work disappears in the sense of creative labor. It just means that work that can be done just as well by a machine is replaced and then if with a basic income people can self-organize into cooperatives and other forms of social economy and solidarity economy activities. No, I think that's possible one way of thinking about it, but on the other hand I think there might be a lot of jobs you don't want to get rid of. Like, I, it's quite possible you could have somebody else, instead of having a human being teaching up here, you could really have a sophisticated online course that will, I'd rather not see that job disappear. I mean, there are jobs that people, and not because of the money I'm making, it's there are jobs that are intrinsically satisfying. Why do we want to get rid of those? You know, this idea of Marx talks about unalienated labor. When you're yes, working, you see the, you have an idea, you see the world take shape, you make something in accordance with what you're, there's something really satisfying about unalienated labor. Now, the alienated labor, the boring labor, yeah, get rid of that, but the other things, some people might want to get rid of it. You can do that in your community or whatever, you know, but I think a lot of people would say, no, I, you know, I like, you know, these kinds of jobs. I like feeling like I'm making a contribution to human well, beings. But the, you're making a contribution and it being a job are two utterly separable 
phenomenon. That is, the question is, what are the things that people get paid to do, and what are the things they do as self-organization? And, and um, it's not plausible to me that, because of the nature of us as a species, that a pure robotic online version of would replace the small group seminar in which people talk face to face and hash out deliberatively through communication. Well, maybe you just put a so something so in someone's brain so, and they'll just know everything. You only have to tell them. So the teaching profession would shift to seminars, or perhaps with with a much higher professor. I mean, student, lower student to professor ratio, many more jobs for professors if the model was tutorials and discussion uh, rather than lecturing in front of a big crowd. If lecturing in front of a big crowd by an online form was as effective a way of communicating the kind of information that that communicates. So, I mean, I, as a general first approximation, maximum automation in a demo, it seems like something that would be opted for, and where some things might not be automated, but probably because they're not actually done better when they're automated. It doesn't actually... It's well, see, that's the idea of done better, meaning done for the person receiving, or the satisfaction that comes with you know doing the labor. There's Why no, doesn't that count? There's no restriction on you doing the labor. You don't have to be paid. It doesn't have to be a job to constitute labor if you have a world of that's the thing I would think. Communities can try different, you know, states can try different things. Which one are people happier doing, and so on and so forth? I don't. I mean, I think unalienated, unalienated labor is a really vital it's part. It's not unalienated but, paid labor. That's the well, no, but whether you can make that distinction it, and make it work, you know, I don't know. We can try. Yeah. It's uh, this is some. This is a theme that tomorrow in the. This is yeah, yeah, yeah. We've done. The freewheeling open. No holes barred discussion tomorrow. Well, holes barred, we're very polite and civilized. Uh, Not tomorrow. necessarily. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, David. And Sue.